While we're putting the final uh, presentation up and everything's getting ready, I'll uh, uh, introduce Dr. Olson. Of course, he. Uh, before I introduce Dr. Olson, uh, just to remind the residents and the fellows that there's a billing meeting right after this, so stay, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, documentation. And of course, Dr. Olson doesn't really need any kind of introduction. You all probably know him better than I do. Uh, uh, but I will share one personal story. Uh, the first time I met Dr. Olson, I think it was on the day that I came for residency interviews. And uh, he, I walk in and he's just totally sick, like just has this cold and he's, you know, sneezing and just tear, you know, everything. And, uh, but yet he's still cheerful and happy and, and excited to see us, or at least he seemed that way. <laughs> and uh, I remember thinking to myself, it would have been so easy for the chair to kind of blow off the, you know, resident interview uh, at, at that time, but yet he still, you know, took the time to, to talk with us and, and made us feel welcome. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, this seems to be someone that is uh, putting, you know, others' interests above his own. And, and you always, everyone talks about how the chair sets the tone for the entire department. And with all my attendings, I've seen that same, you know, kind of benevolent attitude towards others. And it's something I've really appreciated while here you know, as a resident, and it's something I hope to carry on, you know, as I leave. So I, w I thank Dr. Olson for setting that, that tone here in our department. And uh, as a topic today, uh, if you put a little accent mark above the O on function, it's actually uh, in your handout, uh, understanding feco función. It's a little bit of Spanish there for you. So we'll uh, let turn the time over to Dr. Olson. So uh, thanks for those kind comments, and it's interesting actually that uh, it's also French, it's also uh, Portuguese, and it's also Swedish, Norwegian, uh, all of it coming from Latin originally, so we have many words on that. Um, it's a pleasure. These are a series of vignettes. These are a lot of different projects that have been ongoing, and uh, we've got people here in the room that have involved in some of these projects, but uh, I thought it would be nice to just go through some of these over the last several years, uh, many of which are, are now either in publication or accepted. And uh, I do point out that uh, I have no conflict of interest in regards to uh, any of these talks that we're giving. So uh, what works and why? You know, that's a, a big question. And uh, I've got Nick Mamelis back here and others who've been around for a long time. And, and typically what happens when you're talking about cataract surgery is you get a bunch of talking heads. And uh, um, a lot of them are allied with this company or the other. And they say, well, in my experience, this is better. In my experience, that is better. Uh, and one of the comments I used to love is, is that there is, there is no post-occlusion surge whatsoever. The chamber is absolutely stable and, you know, th these things are just not possible physically. I mean, of course there's some. The question is how much, what's the difference? So uh, really this is about eight years ago and it was Dick McCool. He made a statement at a Hawaii meeting about heating in comparison to two, two machines. And I'm a physics major, and I said, that's physically impossible. Unless we've somehow obviated the laws of thermodynamics, the, that can't happen. And so uh, uh, it's just how can we understand this? And it's been trying to objectify all of these different things and see if we can come to some better conclusions about these different modalities and what they do. So. This was the first one, really set up by that meeting at Hawaii. I just thought, you know, we've we got to figure out what's going on here. And I, I figured the culprit likely was 100% power, couldn't be consistent among the different machines. And so uh, uh, this is a Great Britain son, Jason, who was involved. And uh, uh, some people rem remember Rajiv Kumar, who was here. And uh, uh, what we did, to make a long story short, I think you drop right down here, is we found out exactly what I expected was the case that uh, percent power had no correlation between the machines. So if you set legacy, this would be in a balanced salt solution at 100%, it had the same overall power and heat uh, output as sovereign at 43%, as millennium at 36%, and an infinity at 71%. So people comparing 50% percent power back and forth were comparing apples to oranges because they, they weren't the same. Even among the same uh, companies, they weren't the same. And then we uh, were interested in what happened when you have a load because uh, unless your resident's getting started, it doesn't do much good to FACO the aqueous. Usually you want to FACO nuclear fragments, right? They're a little harder and that's what you're trying to get out. 
So uh, we put a load. In this case, we uh, went ahead and, and put a weight. And it turns out just the friction of being in a tight wound is the equivalent of about 175 gram weight hanging off the tip. So this is very real. And you can see that, indeed, they respond differently. Uh, now, it turns out uh, Millennium and, and Sovereign were about the same. And on Signature and Stellaris, you're still the same in regards to that. But you can see Legacy is the outlier. And it turns out that they had different modalities of responding in regards to load. I don't think we understood that very well. Uh, it turns out that uh, uh, what happened in the legacy is it was called a stroke length protected power module. And what does that mean? It's like a cruise control in your car. So uh, if you have your foot pedal to a certain amount, it wants to control the actual excursion of the tip. So what happens with a cruise control? Well, if you set it at 50 miles an hour and you're going uphill, you hear the gas surge, right? You're maintaining that power. But when you go downhill, the gas comes off completely. It wants to keep you at 50 miles an hour. Whereas uh, in this particular case, most of the other machines are like a gas pedal. If you hold your power, uh, your gas at a certain level, you're going to go real slow uphill and fast downhill, but you control it with your foot pedal. So again, that was a big difference. Does that make a difference in regards to how you use it? potentially efficiency, potentially wound burn, those were all questions. And so each of these different projects resulted in a new desire to try to understand what this meant and what was ongoing. So we're going to move from there. That's, uh, you're going to jump forward here about four plus years. And we're going to talk about uh, some of the phacal power modalities and, and capsular breakage properties. These are two papers, uh, the beginning and later on, that came out in the American Journal of Ophthalmology. Joe Schmutz was the one. Uh, he presented a little of this a long time ago, but, uh, uh, but that was uh, earlier in the project. And, uh, and then Jay Meyer was the other one, and we were interested with these different modalities. If you contact the capsule, how likely are you to rupture it? Um, and is there a difference between different modalities if you touch the capsule? Obviously, it's touching the capsule, most likely when you're going to break it. And does it make a difference? What kind of modality was there? So uh, this is the power run, and the reason why I thought this was important to understand is that a lot of the talking heads at meetings were literally saying, in regards to uh, some of the newer horizontal things like OZL, they were saying, pedal to the metal, don't take it off because you can't get a wound burn. Absolutely protective. Uh, there's very little friction inside the wound because it's not a normal longitudinal. It's a wagging from side to side. And therefore, you don't need to worry about wound burn. Well, was that the case or not? Uh, you could easily show there's a lot less friction in the wound because you didn't have nearly the same amount of motion. But is that the only thing that was happening? And so what we discovered in regards to this is, uh, indeed, the one thing that happens if you wag a tip, should be no surprise here, that's sitting stiffly inside of a needle is you're going to get metal stress heating. This is the same thing you do when you take a paper clip and open it and close it real fast. If you feel on the bend after a while, it'll burn your fingers. It gets very hot. So here's our heat generation. Turns out that it's in the direction of the bend. Uh, Ozzel was, uh, and then uh, you can see that it was actually hottest at the hub and coolest at the tip. Ellipse had more consistent heating all the way around. And so this tells us that the needle tip itself is not subtending an arc, but is actually subtending ellipsoid. It actually has some longitudinal movement as well. What does that mean in regards to efficiency and how it functions? We didn't know that. I can tell you that ellipse FX produces a lot more heat and uh, is not going to be different from OZL. So it makes sense. If you're going to add a lot more oomph to that needle, then you're more likely to get some additional heat generation. But now we showed there was a new heat source. It isn't just the friction now. We actually have a metal stress heat source. And when you're talking titanium, it's not going to take long for that to propagate on down the needle. So we raise the issue, mm, maybe this isn't completely safe. You know, Maybe wound burns are a possibility here. And maybe we better rethink that concept that uh, you can use all this ultrasound energy essentially freely without worrying about any possibility of burning the wound. So this kind of summarizes all of that different thing. And our, our suggestion is, is that at 100% power for extended runs uh, with minimal chatter, which is a huge advantage of things like Oz and Ellipse, chatter goes way down. You can get these long runs because it's not bouncing off the tip that uh, there'd be a possibility for wound burn. More about that later. So then we went on and did this study in regards to our likelihood of breaking the capsule. 
Uh, we started out with some lenses, and these were fresh human lenses. Uh, sadly, once you tapped it and broke it, uh, then you couldn't use it again, so we ran out of lenses relatively rapidly in this particular project. But we could show that there indeed were differences, so uh, this would be 612, so 6 milliseconds on, 12 seconds off, milliseconds off, that would be something like hyperpulse or white star or ultra pulse, uh, all variations the same thing. We looked at Ozel, which you can see sitting here, here's ellipse, and then ellipse sharp. One of the big things that we noticed with this is the Dewey radius tip was very protective. Indeed, that, uh, that not having a sharp edge rounding it, that indeed you could tap many more times. It was much harder to break that capsule. Now, the interesting sidebar of this is that without ultrasound, just with aspiration, we did not break the capsule. If, and this is just touching it. Now, I'm sure if you pushed on it, but if you just touch it and come off. With ultrasound is where you could get that capsule to break. So uh, we went to... Uh, with this human, so 100% power, Oswald may be more likely to break the capsule. Uh, Ultrapulse more likely to be at low power and transmit ultrasound at high power because that's how they're going to be used. A radius tip is protective. And so we just said there's some things we're seeing here. And so uh, they went, and I thought it was a very innovative about using saran wrap around a coffee can, tightly put as a capsular substitute to see what's the likelihood you'd make a hole in this saran wrap as time went on. And so this would be percent breaks for 200 taps in under scope. You just touch it and come back and, and come back. And this was uh, at, uh, uh, we don't have it here, but it was at high vacuum. Uh, now these are peristaltic systems. So uh, uh, the question is how much vacuum you have if you're just touching it and whether you left it longer. But this is the information. So you could see if it's a 19 gauge sharp that it was more likely to break than a 20 gauge. Well, that makes sense from the laws of physics. The overall <coughs> area of aspiration or power is going to be a square of the function of the size of the port, and 19 is bigger, so you're going to have more hold on that overall tip. Um, and it turns out that, uh, uh, indeed, again, we found if it was a dull radius tip that it really did cut down the likelihood of breaking. Uh, the other thing to find out, which is a study coming up soon, is does that also decrease your efficiency, though? Physics rarely gives something without taking away. It's always a double-edged sword. And that's something that we often forget about. You've got to think about what is that negative that potentially you're going to get in association with a positive. You can see if you drop the power, though, it's really fairly forgiving. Uh, here's a lips at 100% power. And you can see that, uh, again, that we found the radius tip was very safe. Something interesting happens here, though. In both these situations, when you go from a 19 to 20, every time, it is statistically significantly less likely to break with a 20, but it's significantly more likely to break with the Ozel going from 19 to 20 with the Intrepid cartridge. What's up about that? And that doesn't fit with our laws of thermodynamics. So gave us some time to think about that, uh, about exactly what's going on. And I hope I included that particular information here. Yeah, so there is another thing going on, and that is in trying to control post-occlusion surge, there are lots of different ways, and if we had a long lecture, I could go into the different ways we have of trying to control the fluid flow to minimize that occlusion break surge or collapse of the capsule. And one of them is to make very, very long, thin channels that the fluid has to go through, and that will dramatically cut down the velocity of that flow, which will cut down the surge. The problem in association with that, again, laws of physics is, is that your actual vacuum at the tip, even unoccluded, is much higher than I think people realize. And that's what this particular uh, thing is here, unoccluded flow vacuum. So this is the amount of vacuum needed at the tip with these new cartridges in or order to allow the fluid to flow. And you can see the Intrepid, which does a very good job in controlling post-occlusion surge, ends up with a 20-gauge tip of having extremely high vacuum. So the difference in vacuum here was enough to overcome the decreased size of the radius. And the vacuum itself, because the vacuum was much higher, even though the overall area size was smaller, was enough that it was more likely to break the, the overall uh, tip, uh, the overall uh, capsule, or in this case, our substitute. So uh, another thing that we know we have to look at. So I'm bouncing through these fairly rapidly, and we'll have time for questions later on. So. Uh, 
we felt that it's clinically used, occluded with long high power ultrasound runs, uh, that it's going to be highest wound burn for uh, OZL and, and I think a like likely ellipse FX. We haven't studied that in this detail because it does produce similar amounts of heat. Uh, transverse in general is clinically used, which means very high power. If you touch the capsule with a sharp tip, you're more likely to break it because you don't use longitudinal ultrasound at those high levels. Uh, and the key thing here is, is that it does take ultrasound to touch the capsule to break it. If you're just aspirating and you touch it, as long as you don't put any pressure, they will not break. I think that's a, a critical lesson we learned from this. And in trying to control post-occlusion surge, uh, what we're ending up with vacuum levels as high as Venturi just to get the fluid to flow even without occlusion. So uh, <coughs> in trying to answer more about wound burn, uh, this particular thing that happens, and uh, uh, briefly in regards to wound burn, uh, it's actually a thermal contracture of collagen around the wound, and it's been shown to occur at 60 degrees centigrade, and it typically at that temperature takes about a second. Now the problem is, is that you don't have any way of knowing what the temperature is, and so you may feel you're perfectly safe and you're sitting at 58, 57, uh, but you, you get over that little point, and then obviously the burn occurs, and it occurs very, very rapidly. So we didn't have much of any information other than a series. So we, uh, the first paper we did was a relatively small survey here through north northwestern United States. And uh, this paper in AJO, uh, we showed that it was, a, uh, and we defined it as contracture or fold. So this would be significant wound burn, about one in 1,000, 75 wound burns. And uh, we were able to look at it in a little uh, detail to find out what it meant. Uh, in association with the burn, and uh, uh, it, it gave us a handle on more that we wanted to look at. But again, I just mentioned the 60 degree rule. It's a result of friction and metal stress, and obviously the other risky thing we do in, in regards to a, a very bad wound burn is that uh, uh, if we do occlude the tip so we don't have the cooling of the fluid going through, then the uh, rate, I, ha I didn't put that particular part of one of these papers, and the rate of increase of your temperature goes up anywhere from three to tenfold. That makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, if you've got fluid flowing on something, it, it will take the heat off very, very rapidly. That's what you do when something's hot. You put it under water and let it run. It cools it off very fast. But if you've occluded the tip, you don't have that cooling influence, so the heat temperature is going to go much, much higher and more rapidly. Uh, OVD, we're going to talk about that. Viscoelastic may be related. Uh, practice patterns, these are all issues that we thought needed some additional work and we need to understand it. Here's an example of a very bad wound burn, um, and uh, uh, Jorge Alio uh, showed this to me, was interested in how this was possible. You can see it's so bad that actually the iris was burned and had to be removed. They had to do a corneal transplant. This is a year out and the patient was still only 20, 60. Here's the hooker on this. This wound burn happened from the time, because they had it on the video, from the time ultrasound was hit until the wound burn occurred was three seconds. That's not much margin for error, three seconds, and a very bad wound burn, as you can see. So how's that possible? How can we explain that? So this is the, some of the in vitro work that we talked about, uh, and so we know it's aspiration block, time ultrasound is on, total energy use, so that's time per power level, and ultrasound in OVD, and I'd have thought I had that work included here. Here it is. So uh, this is uh, Jeremy Valentine, Michael Floyd, uh, two medical students doing some work. We went ahead and had a nice project, and I was suspicious that something funny has happened in OVD. We used to think it's just that you block flow. And I said, this, this, this doesn't make sense. And I said, I think viscoelastic may be exothermic. And so uh, we measured the actual heat production. Uh, on a, so this is occluded, so we knew that it's the same. And so we used one would be balanced salt solution occluded, and then how much heat was produced when you had viscoelastic occluded. And you can see it is exothermic, invariably exothermic, and quite exothermic across the spectrum. And uh, it turns out that I've now figured out what this is in talking to some engineers and association who know OVDs well, it's, it's a resonance of disulfide bonds that exist. And this correlates exactly with the number of disulfide bonds that exist in the different viscoelastic. But who would know that uh, if you did ultrasound 
um, inside of uh, uh, viscose, for instance, that uh, it's seven times more rapid heat buildup occluded than it is in balanced salt solution. So uh, we thought that this also may be something of potential importance in regards to that wound burn occurring. Uh, and uh, 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 another feeling about this is that uh, if you're going to be using something like CHOP and you're not going to use as much ultrasound, it would seem that your approach is probably protective. Uh, if you're going to be more parsimonious in ultrasound use, I mean, it made sense that, uh, and there was a suggestion of that in that uh, a survey in the 2006 uh, AJO. So uh, this is uh, the latest. Uh, this will be coming out in JCRS. And we happen to have the editor, Nick Mamlis, in here. So, Nick, I'm not going to give all the facts here. I, I want you to know we're not going to give all of the good information coming out in that paper. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. So, so uh, <coughs> what, I, what I do want to tell you in regards to this, and uh, we had uh, uh, some people who've been here scattered around the country that were involved in putting this together, and uh, uh, Sorensen is one of our medical students. But uh, we found that, uh, and we, we ended up with about a million surgeries and over 400 burns. So nothing like this had ever occurred before. And we found that the greatest correlate was with the surgical volume. It was inverse. The busier the surgeon, the less likely the burn to be. So uh, what does that mean exactly? What that, what that means is, I don't think you have to be a busy surgeon to avoid it, that if you're busy, you tend to be parsimonious. You know, you've got to be relatively fast. You're being careful how you use your energy, and if you're going to do that, then you're less likely to have a burn. That was highly statistically significant. The second was with surgical approach, and these are all independent, and these are modified with a Bonferrani correction. So these p-values had to be very high in order for them to be statistically significant, because we did have multiple comparisons. And you can see that that was also very, very significant and correlated with how you approach it, which we kind of thought would be the case. It's nice to have that. But the third was with OVD. So which OVD used had an important role in stating whether or not you were going to get a burn. Now, uh, no, no other was statistically significantly correlated. However, there was an independent variable that was more important than any of these that showed a marked randomness through this overall sample size in regards to wound burn. And uh, we call that high-risk behavior. And, and I, I'd like to explain high-risk behavior just by talking about, you know, uh, my five children. And uh, we've got incredible kids, but we knew we were, we were in trouble when this event happened for our number two child uh, when he was two years of age. I was at UCLA, and uh, uh, we could on weekends go and use the pool that they had for the uh, swimming team and the high dive group. And I thought it would be kind of cool to jump off the platform. I wasn't going to try to dive off there. So I go off the high dive platform, and the water there is about 15 to 18 feet deep because they're doing these high dives, and I jump into the water. And as I'm coming out, everybody's screaming about this little kid and say, what are you doing? And I look over in horror to see our two-year-old, he was two in diapers, never been in water before, is climbing up the high dive platform. And so, uh, you know, Obviously, the lifeguard, hey, little kid, get off of there. What are you doing? And I'm like, Patrick, what are you doing? Get off of there. And he's laughing. He thinks this is pretty funny. So he climbs up on the high dive platform and jumps off the high dive platform. He's two. So uh, I'm closest. I'm sitting on the side. So I push off the side. I go down, and I pick him up deep enough in the water that I can push off the bottom. And I'm convinced that he's going to aspirate water. I'm convinced that, you know, I mean, he's traumatized. Who knows what happened? He hit pretty cleanly, which was amazing in and of itself. I push off the bottom, hold him up in horror. He cracks a big smile and says, do it again. <laughs> now, which of our five children do you think has uh, been in an avalanche, broken five bones, uh, fallen off a cliff, uh, uh, you know, everything you can imagine and associate with it. So, so that's high-risk behavior. And all of the things we talked about, so if you're not careful what you do, obviously you can get yourself in trouble in regards to wound burn. So let's look at this in more detail. So uh, surgical approach, we already said that surgical approach was uh, uh, very highly associated in regards to whether or not you're getting a wound burn. Uh, what I like about this, this is fully adjusted, and that's the problem when you have variables where there are multiple different ones in place, and we looked at a whole host of variables. So all of those have been adjusted trying to look cleanly at juice wound burn, and it kind of splits fairly nicely. You've got divide and conquer and carousel are sitting up here. Stop and chop 
somewhere sitting in the middle and all the chops are sitting right here and, and uh, they're statistically uh, not different. Uh, this actually is different from these two except with the bond for any correction it isn't but it, it kind of fits in this category. But this group is highly different from that. And it all has to do with if you're going to use more mechanical approach, if you're not using much ultrasound, then obviously you're much less likely to develop the heat that you need to produce a wound burn. Uh, uh, clearly this is more likely to happen with a real hard nucleus, but uh, I do think that chopping approaches, and we, we did see this uh, not on a multivariate analysis, but independently in the first survey, and so I do think your mechanical approaches are more likely to prevent the events wound burn. We're going to save questions till later because I know you're thinking. I can see it on your face. You're, you're, you're looking that one over. Uh, now, in each category, it's quite variable. I mean, there are people who I know who chop, who use a lot of ultrasound, and, and I'm very parsimonious. Uh, I only use little bursts, as little as possible. So obviously, the less ultrasound you're going to use, the less like you can generate heat, and that's just pure physics. You can't get around that. Look at this in regards to OVD. Uh, fully adjusted again, and you can see Helon 5 is the big outlier. Helon 5Y, we showed was very exothermic, and it does an incredible job of blocking any flow. So uh, uh, that was the highest overall group we had. It was highly statistically significant. We never studied OcuCoat. My guess is because it's about, it's not particularly viscous that it was that high. I have a feeling it's also highly exothermic. But other than that, it pretty well correlated with the uh, exothermicity ratio. But you can see there is a difference here. Uh, these kind of split into this one, and then you've got this group sitting right here that held together, and then you've got these down here that were lower. So they were three different groups who were significantly different between them. But something to remember, here's the takeaway though. Oh, I didn't show you. The takeaway is you can avoid OVD wound burn every time. You just have to allow about 10 seconds of irrigation and aspiration to produce an OVD, OVD free zone overneath the nucleus, and you're, you're not going to get this problem. It's, it's uh, uh, Jorge Alio's case. I asked, what did you use when I had these results? And he went back, and it was Helon 5, and it was pedal to the metal using Ozel right off the beginning. And uh, uh, you're not going to get any fluid flow. You're putting ultrasound immediately into a very exothermic substance. And that's how you get a burn in three seconds. That's the record I know. But you can do it in three seconds out of those circumstances. Just spend a little time. Just, just, just doesn't take long. Just a few seconds to produce that OVD-free zone over the nucleus. You can avoid that. Uh, <coughs> this has to do with uh, 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 power burn uh, rates adjusted for surgical volume. And uh, you can see here's a continuous. Now, this one is clearly an outlier. It's sitting here on the high side with a bond for any correction. It didn't quite make it, but otherwise, uh, that, that's sitting up here and it's significantly worse. But look at Ozelthus longitudinal. It, it came in number two. So uh, the issue here is Ozel is not protective if you're going to go 100% power with long runs. Uh, even Ozel alone sat right about in the middle of the pack. We had too few cases to analyze this, so I, I can't, we can't make much of that particular one. But you can see how the overall correlation with uh, what your particular approaches are. Um, and uh, uh, hyperpulse, in this case, did not turn out to be protective either. But there is no power modality that you can just use it and not get to 60 degrees. That's the key thing here. Uh, and uh, the idea that somehow that this is free and you can proceed forward, uh, yeah, it's, just, it's just not possible. So you've you got to be careful how you use all of these and you can exceed that temperature. So light on the pedal. Never ultrasound an anterior chamber full of viscoelastic. Just give it a little time to uh, aspirate. I think if you en enhance mechanical approaches and consider more forgiving ultrasound modalities where you potentially can use a little less energy, I think all that together may be important. I think it's a, it's a largely avoidable complication. So uh, <coughs> the final thing we're going to talk about here has to do with the kind of the holy grail of a lot of this. I was going to throw in our post-occlusion surge uh, information, uh, but I think we've talked enough about that before, and I know that you've got to get on to uh, another section here soon. So let's finish with this. Phaco efficiency and chatter. So what we want to know about these different modalities, do they make a difference in regards to how rapidly they're going to remove a similarly sized nuclear fragment? That's very hard to do in cataracts because every cataract's different, and how do, how do you randomize that uh, between different groups. It's extremely difficult to do. So we wanted to come up with some type of in vitro way 
And chatter, of course, is the inefficiency in association with bouncing a particle off the tip. And if it bounces off the tip, you've got to go seek it and get it back again. And obviously, you're not doing ultrasound during that period of time. So we want to remove something, but we don't want to have chatter of that piece bouncing around. Uh, <coughs> in, a, in actual fact, uh, it says submitted, but uh, uh, this is being redone and reworked. And we've got a much better paper. And Jeff Petty has uh, uh, been involved in that. Um, and uh, we've got some very interesting things. Uh, in regard, I think we've got a way better paper that's about ready to be submitted. But uh, uh, we've looked at different ways of uh, microwave and formalin, and uh, Dr. Wong was a former resident, worked a long time on this. We wanted to try to create a consistent hardness and a consistent size uh, particle. Uh, this is a, a lens treatment regimen that we came up with. And uh, uh, Griffin Jardine, I give credit for finally perfecting a, a pretty innovative way of sitting here and slicing these hardened lenses. And you can see you slice them one way, turn them, slice them another way. And then finally, you end up with uh, cubes that are two millimeters squared. So they're consistent in regards to their size. And uh, we started out in uh, our way of trying to uh, show that this was an effective and a good way approach with Ozil, Ozil IP, Ellipse, Ellipse FX. And I think we've talked a little bit about those modalities and how they work and what they do. So it's pretty simple. You know, you uh, uh, put it inside of this. Uh, you know, our use a little chamber that you use, uh, and then you just aspirate it, and then you have your parameters set, and then you hit the pedal down all the way, and then you look at the number of times it bounces off. Try to time it only when it's sitting at the tip, and the chatter is the number of times you can clearly see it bounce off. The efficiency is time to removal, and uh, do 20 ones for modality, and so you have statistical power. You can make comparisons. So the original thing that we had, we looked at, these are the numbers that we had, but these are very, very long. And uh, uh, the criticism made is that's in innovative and interesting, but those are way longer than anything close to the clinical situation. And so uh, you've got to show us something that's clinically more relevant. Uh, you can show that, uh, indeed, that uh, if you increase the power, that you would uh, often increase the chatter. Uh, and, of course, chatter would result in inefficient. I think it also results in complications. It's looking after that piece that's bound off. Or you're more uh, bounced off. You're more likely to get to the caps. You're more likely to break it, all of those different things. Uh, and so uh, we went back to the drawing board. And uh, David DeMille, Brian Zog, Jeff Petty, and, and, and Jeff, you want to present this. So I'm just going to give a little tidbit here. I'm not going to steal the thunder. So you've still got this that uh, you or anybody that wants to present. But thanks to Jeff Taven, thank you, sir. He brought us a bunch of uh, uh, fresh human nuclei. Uh, these were all, I think, out of Africa. So uh, we've got good, hard human particles, and, uh, and we cubed them, cut them down to where we could look at. And this work, I think, is extremely solid. Uh, lots and lots of different runs and, and uh, a more comprehensive look at exactly what's going on. And I, I'm just going to summarize a few things when we looked at that that Ozil IP was better than Ozil. That's what they say, and we you know, certainly showed that. In general, uh, ellipse FX, then ellipse, in general, it was way more complex. There's a lot of, uh, this is going to be a really nice paper. There's a lot of nice complexities that's going on. Uh, optimal Ozil IP and ellipse FX were statistically similar. So when you finally got down to that, uh, and, and you optimize their parameters, and it wasn't what you think. And I mean. Uh, uh, a lot of times uh, it isn't more power because then you get the chatter. And once you got a lot of chatter, then the efficiency drop like a rock. So too much power, uh, less vacuum, and increased chatter, which hammers efficiency. And that's all I'm going to say. So, Jeff, uh, you know, you're ready. You've got all kinds of tidbits there. But uh, uh, we, we're rushing to get this together and get this submitted because uh, I don't think anybody's ever done this before. How many runs total did we do with these human lens particles? Aren't we sitting up like about four or 500 runs? 300? Yeah. So this is, this is beautiful work and with some very nice statistics and uh, uh, really very impressive. So conclusions, and this was just a vignette uh, associated with a few of the articles that started uh, when uh, uh, actually it would be 2005 in January. I said, you know, we got to get a better handle to this. Uh, there's probably about 25 or 30 papers all told at it, looking at different aspects of this. Newer ultrasound modalities increase efficiency. Uh, lower vacuum and too much power result in both excessive chatter and decreased efficiency. 
So understanding those, and it's now a lot of people are saying, is this really better than UltraPulse? Well, we're going to be able to look at that. And uh, we're going to validate an animal lens model that we think we can show is exactly the same as humans or with greater consistency. And then we're off to the races. There's about 12 papers I've got outlined ready to go if Jeff's up to it and uh, the rest of the team. That uh, for the first time we can start answering these questions, which is way cool. Uh, and, and, and I just want to point out that uh, uh, even though uh, I, always, I always get ideas that bounce in, I, I absolutely know none of this would be possible without a host of medical students, residents, and fellows and their hard work. I got to thank them immensely for uh, taking part and uh, being involved in putting these things together and making them happen. I'm not aware of a larger body of work that exists in regards to trying to look at a host of things, uh, but in this case, looking at FACO and what works and what doesn't work and what's real and what's not real. So uh, it's been extremely, I think, important work in trying to uh, make everybody honest about this uh, overall debate and discussion. And uh, um, I, I can't thank everybody involved enough that have helped put these projects together. Thank you. All right, Bala, fire away. Bala, you had a question. I thought you had one brewing in. I thought you were about ready to go. Yes. No. But uh, you're going to have to assume, and, and uh, there's, there's always a problem when you do something like this, but you're going to have to assume that by the time you've gotten up to a million surgeries that uh, uh, it's unlikely that there could be a gross randomized difference between groups. And, and there's nothing you can do about that. But so so uh, you're just going to have to assume, and that's what they do in these large surveys. You, you've got to assume that once you get to a certain number of places that those kinds of variables would likely have randomized out. And I have no way of... Uh, other than that that is the usual theory, but I have no way of, of knowing that for sure. Any other questions about this? Nick? <laughs> so uh, uh, Nick's talking about something. I've got plenty of bruises and scars from those battles over the years. Uh, and, uh, 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 but the, wor the word has to get out. Nick's absolutely correct. And, and another thing that bugs me almost more is, uh, is the science in which it's extremely rigorous but it's looking at things that are going to show a difference that don't represent the clinical situation and don't, and don't represent. They represent an aspect of it, so it looks like it's answering the question, but, but we've already done enough work on it to know that they've, they've it's, it's an apologist way of trying to, uh, trying to say this is, this is our, it, it would be, for instance, uh, like tobacco companies trying to point out there's no differences between smoking and they go to a population where nobody smokes hardly and things such as that. But, uh, uh, I, I'll just talk about one other, and uh, where's Jeff? Are you still here? So ha has this group already heard about, uh, you presented the, the work that we did in regards to aberometry, I think, already, right? So, I mean, that's a perfect example. Um, a good friend of mine, I'm not going to mention his name, and, and was up there, and oh, yeah, you know, you can absolutely line up your intraocular lens, and oh, you, you can do your limbal relaxing incisions, because you can measure right there in the case, and and change your intraocular lens because the power isn't right. And I'm like, give me a break. It, it, you know, it, it can't, it, your, your overall cylinder and axis can't be the same with a, uh, you know, with a, with a uh, speculum sitting there. And then let alone you've made an incision. And how in the world can you know the anterior chamber depth? And 
Uh, I think that was a beautiful piece of work also coming out in JCRS that showed it's all over the place. And, and, you know, and frankly, I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed for a couple of my colleagues who, who've been out there with, who, who've literally are telling people to change in tracker lenses on the table. You don't know your answer chamber depth on the table at the, at the end of the case. What we found is, it's no surprise, it's usually deeper than it's going to be a week later. And on an average, about a diopter difference. So, but, but we hear that all the time. I mean, Nick shakes his head. I mean, he knows exactly what I'm talking about. So, so uh, the, mess, the lesson for everybody is, is you need to try to have enough understanding to be, look at this with some rigor, be, be open-minded, but always a little bit suspicious about what's being fed to you. And, and if you have questions and issues, some of these things aren't that hard to do. Uh, and and it, it's kind of fun to sit there and figure out what's really going on and uh, uh, point out that, uh, yeah, it may sound great in theory, but in practice it's just not going to work. So uh, we didn't look at outcomes in this particular study because uh, uh, there's a certain limit to what you're likely to be able to get reliable information, and we were right at that limit according to the biostatisticians working with us. Uh, but we did define it as this was something in which you had folds in the cornea and that you actually had contracture of the wound. So this wasn't, I, I think there's a lot of, people are calling them wound burns and they're really localized edema. We didn't want to have that. So you actually had to have folds and changes. There's series that have looked at that, and uh, I mean, you saw this one. They actually had to do a patch graft and cover it with conjunctiva to get this one filled, and that happened in three seconds. So the severity depends on how long you let that temperature continue to increase, because the contracture will get larger and larger. I've seen some, I, I was going to throw up this picture of one that has 11 sutures through a thre three millimeter wound and then glue over all the top to finally get that thing to seal. And you can just see the cornea just flattened down uh, and uh, uh, from that contracture in that area, and, and uh, there was 32 diopters of cylinder in that particular area. <laughs> they can be very bad. All right, I think uh, we're supposed to move over to the uh, phase two of this, right? So, so, so we'll go we'll go from the uh, from the regal to the mundane and talk about billing. Is that what's going to happen? <laughs>